Well, good morning, everyone. You know, when I was gone, I reset my watch, and I see I'm behind about five minutes, so you might get a shorter sermon if I'm going by my watch. No. It's good to see you all. I've been away for a couple weeks, but glad to be back, and uh, I know you were in good hands with uh, Pastor Evan, um, but it's always a good time to come back. It's always good for me to come and, and, and be back with our church family, to be here to worship with you, and to be with you uh, in, in body and in spirit. I wanted to uh, start us out this morning uh, thinking about kind of this essential or basic understanding of, of what God is about and what we are about and what we believe that God tells us about our connection with him. That's something that is so important to, to really uh, bring deep into our hearts, to allow deep into our hearts, to, uh, to remember. Because otherwise, if we don't remember this, then we, we have a tendency to doubt ourselves. We have a tendency to doubt God's love. And so I wanted to start us out with this, Romans chapter 8 verses 38 and 39. It's a passage I think you will know and recognize. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. That truth is so important for us to remember that God loves us so much, we're going to talk about that, that nothing can separate us from him. Let, let that word nothing separ- or sink into your heads and into your hearts this morning. I'm going to invite you to rise in body or in spirit to receive God's greeting uh, before we greet one another. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn and greet one another in the name of Christ.
going on in our church. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at your bulletin, look at the announcements, look at all the um, things. We have uh, our second best sale coming up in uh, less than a month, which seems impossible, but here it out is. Uh, we have new dining out groups. If you are newer to our church, if you've been visiting with us, and especially if you'd like a way to get a little more connected, get to know some people, uh, maybe you don't... Uh, yeah, maybe you've uh, wondered how to do that. Our dining out groups are a really great way to do that. Uh, they are uh, being formed. Uh, Bill, could you raise your hand really quick? Bill is the one who organizes all of that. He makes sure that we get into different groups where we uh, get a chance to interact with each other. So uh, if you're interested, after the service, go uh, look for Bill, and he'll be able to, uh, he'll be able to put you, plug you into one of those if you're interested. Uh, we also, as you know, we have an Ideal Park fall fishing event. This is going to be up at uh, uh, the De Young's Cottage, and uh, they're not here this morning, so I can't have, you have him raise his hand. But if you are interested, we want to note this is uh, September 12th through the 15th. Uh, this is not just for men. Actually, if women would like to go fishing or learn how to fish, you are welcome. We have more than enough accommodation to... Um, to uh, create separate uh, places to sleep and uh, different, Maury has tons of room up at his cottage. So if you are interested, please let Tom know or call uh, the number on here. Uh, it's a really fun time. It's not just fishing. It's also times of fellowship, eating together. It's times of uh, prayer together. It's time of reflection together about what we are about and about who God is. And uh, it, it's always a really great time of strengthening and binding us together. Uh, also note that uh, for the Bible League, uh, there's a Bible League conference coming up. Uh, talk to Pat. Pat, can you raise your hand? Talk to her if you're interested in that. And, well, as you can see, we just have so many things going on. Of course, always we invite you to stay afterwards for coffee and cookies and, and, uh, and, and goodies afterwards in order to strengthen our bond, to get to know one another. Um, it's also not in here, but we also have our 4 o'clock discussion. If you're newer to our church, and maybe you haven't heard that or had that mentioned, but we have a time at 4 o'clock. We come back together at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We just sit. We have some questions for the sermon or with the sermon that I put together, but uh, we just come, we read the text again, and we talk, and we share, and we think, and we reflect, and we pray. Um, if that's something you're interested in, there are no pre prerequisites. You don't have to need to have gone to seminary. You don't even have had to listen to the sermon that well. If you don't, um, you can just come and, uh, uh, and talk and listen and, and, and be together to uh, talk and, and, and pray and, and dig a little deeper into uh, what the Bible says. Yes. <gasps> I saw that. Thank you. So in a little while, we'll have our noisy offering. Um, that's our time. Every year we have a, um, every year we have a, no oh, somebody already put stuff in there. That's good. Uh, every year we do our noisy offering. Every year we choose a different cause. If you have spare change or more than spare change and would like to come and donate to that, uh, you'll, you'll hear it when it happens. It's after our regular offering. Um, anyone can come up and give to that. This year we are now giving to uh, last year we were raising money for, for, uh, for chickens. This year we're doing chickens and sunflower seeds for the Esther School in Zambia. So keep that in mind, a good cause. Uh, we have so much, we are blessed with so much, especially when our uh, giving overflows into something good. It's really pleasing and beautiful for the Lord. So let's keep that in mind uh, as we get ready to do that. But before we do that, before we... Uh, before we pray, before we hear a sermon, before we eat coffee and cookies and together, let's take a few moments, um, quiet our hearts, maybe let the things go that have been on our hearts for this last week, the things that have been busy, the things that have distracted us, the things that have taken our attention away from God. Let's take a few moments and just put that aside and remember why we're here. We're here to be with God and to, uh, because he calls us, because we cannot be separated. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let's take a few moments and remember that.
Let's pray together. We come, Lord, not because we are worthy, not because we have done something, but because you've done everything. We come this morning, Lord, recognizing who we are. We come recognizing that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are made in your image and that you call us beloved. And yet we recognize that within our own hearts and within our own lives and within our own selves, we cannot pretend to be perfect. We cannot pretend that we have it all together. You tell us in your word that if we act as if we're perfect, if we are without sin, we deceive ourselves. We come in this tension recognizing that you love us so much and yet we are broken. We are human. And yet your love wins out. Your forgiveness is beyond what we could achieve. Lord, we try and we try sometimes. We, we think that still we have to prove ourselves and we think that still we have to uh, live up to a certain expectation and we, we think that we have to come and that if, if we don't, then we're going to lose your love. And then you tell us that nothing in all of creation, neither height nor depth, nor anything can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Lord, maybe this morning there are some who are doubting that. Maybe there are some this morning who feel that they are not good enough. Maybe there are some who are coming and, and feeling that we don't measure up, that, that, that we're not worthy of your love, that, that, we can't, uh, that we haven't done enough. Or maybe we're coming thinking we've done all the wrong things and that, and that we, are, we, we are too far away from you. And yet you again remind us nothing can separate us from the love that is yours, neither height nor depth nor nothing, anything else in all of creation. Or maybe the opposite is true. Maybe, Lord, we're coming and we think we've lived a good enough life. Maybe we're coming, Lord, thinking I've got my act together. I've put on a good face. Maybe we're coming and thinking that we have somehow earned our way into your presence. And, Lord, humble us, we pray. It's not a an easy prayer to pray, humble us, but Lord, we need to be humble before you, recognizing that there is nothing that we do that earns our way into your presence. It's only by your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, whether we are doubting or whether we are self-assured, remind us of the truth of it all, that it is only in Christ Jesus, it is only by his atoning death, it is only by his forgiveness that we can come. And it is only by that that we are bound to you and connected to you. It is only by that that we are held as your children, forgiven and loved. Lord, as we live in this life of forgiveness and this life of justification, not by what we do, but by what you have done, Lord, I pray that we live into it in thankfulness. We pray, Lord, for the works of this church and for all the ways in which we live into this calling, which is your love, this forgiving love. Lord, as we as a church are here and gathered today, we are a picture of what this love is about, coming from many different places and walks, yet being together. Lord, thank you for the works of this church as we move forward and we begin things like gems and cadets and 
reaching out to our neighborhood through fall programs that we'll have, or even as we've had them this summer, thank you for all of them. Thank you for the opportunities to demonstrate and show and to tell and, and mirror your love, to let your light and love that forgives and accepts shine through ourselves even though we are imperfect. Thank you that you are this kind of God and that you are the kind of God who does not leave us and that you walk with us. Even as we remember that we cannot be separated from you, we remember that you walk with us through even the hardest of times. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who are hurting this morning or who have family members who are hurting. Maybe those hurts are spoken. Maybe they are things that we know about. Maybe they're things that we've shared in the bulletin. Uh, maybe they're things that we've been praying for for a long time. Or maybe they're things that, we, uh, that are new. And then there are those things, Lord, that are between you and us, that are between, uh, that are within our own soul. Thank you that you do not call us to bear them alone. Thank you that we can come to you and that you always walk with us through it all. Lord, we just take a few seconds, a few moments to offer up to you our needs, the things that are on our hearts, the things that we are thankful for, or maybe the things that we need help with. There are so many of those things within our own hearts. I imagine each person here has something that we need to give to you, trusting you as our Father who does not separate from us. So let's take a few moments and just give those things over to God. Lord, you are everlasting to everlasting. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are everything. You are our all in all. Lord, as we continue to worship you, as we give you our offerings, whether it's something monetarily or of our time, or maybe it's just our heart, Lord, we pray you receive it. We know you will. As you love us, may you work in us to turn our love and our hearts back to you in all the fullness that we can. Lord, I, we come this morning and we thank you for it all. We recognize that you are good. We recognize that you invite us into this time and may that be the reminder for us that you are the inviter. You also, Lord, invite us to pray. You invite us to give to you our words and our hearts. Let's take a, t a few moments. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together as uh, our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I will now invite the deacons to come forward, collect this morning's offering. Uh, this morning we'll be collecting for our general fund and our technology fund. And then, of course, afterwards, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have our noisy offering.
Well, good morning. I was talking to them, not you guys. I am going to need some help this morning from a few of you. I wondered, maybe I'm going to have you two help with the bigger one, okay? I'm going to have you two help with the smaller one. All right. Emily, can you come here? Owen, you come over here. Here, you hold that. Don't let that go. Okay, you take this. Okay, walk that way. You, that way. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Go, 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 go until it won't go anymore. Oh, I think it's going to stop. Oh, that's it. All right, keep holding it, okay? Wow. All right, let's put that down. That is, can you guys come and tell me what this number says? Oh, the big, the smaller one. Six feet. Wow. That's pretty big. I'm, I'm five foot ten, so I'm not quite six feet tall. All right. I need you two to come and help. All right. I've got this one. I have a feeling, actually, I don't know how big it is. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Amber, can you take this? And you're going to have to press this button here. Or just pull. Pull, pull, pull. Pull, pull, pull. Go, go, go until it stops. Oh, it stopped. All right, Amber, what's, what's, what's the number on this? Let's see. This says 15. What comes after 15? 16. Wow, that is 16 feet long. Let's put that down. That is, who's the tallest person in here? I don't know. That is much taller than me, 16 feet. You know, I bet if Mr. Uh, Dave Thacker were here, he's not, he'd have an even bigger one. He always has a, a tape measure on his. What do we use these for? Measuring stuff, that's right, it's a tape measure. We use it to measure stuff. And, and quite often in life, that's what we do. We try to measure things, to say, how big is it? How heavy is something? I just went on a trip, and I stepped on the, on the, on the scale, and I measured how much weight I gained from all the eating. Um, sometimes measuring is good, sometimes we, but we like to measure things. Now, there's something that's interesting in the Bible, though. It says there's something that we... It, 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 we, we can't really measure. Do you know what that is? What's something that we can't measure? Do you know? Potatoes. Potatoes. Well, we could. We, <laughs> we can, as, you know, it says we can try to measure God's love for us. It says, it says though it's so big, do you think it's bigger than six feet? Do you think it's bigger than, than, than 16 feet? It, it is so big. And, and it says nothing in else, can, nothing can separate. The, as far as the east is from the west, God has, has, has removed our sin from us, which means that as far as we can get away from one end to the other, as far as anyone can imagine measuring, that, that's how far God loves us. And nothing is going to change that, it says. Now, I think that's pretty good news, don't you? That God loves us that much more than six feet, more than 16 feet. I want us to remember that, okay? Nothing can separate us. Nothing can measure and say, God doesn't love you anymore. Let's pray, okay? Lord God, thank you so much for your love that is so great. And even as we stand out or uh, stretch out these tape measures and, and, and look at different measurements, we remember that your love is so much bigger than we can imagine. Lord, help us to remember that nothing separates us from that great love. And that we are your children. And that... You are good, and your love endures forever, which is a, a, a number we can't measure. It's forever and ever and ever. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Thank you for these children. Thank you not just for these children here, but our, these adult children. For uh, those of us in the congregation, we are all children of God. Remind us of all of these things as your children. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand up. And you know what we're going to say, right? Lord be, all right. One, two, three. Lord be with you. 
All right, you can head down to children. Don't tape, don't trip on the tape measures. Okay, you got it. Good job. Oh, 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 that was close. That was close before we have an accident here. We like to measure things, don't we? I really was hoping Dave was here because I wanted to see how big his was. All right. Well, I've been away for a week or two, and I'm guessing Rev Ev did not preach on Colossians while I was gone. Oh, okay. John already told me what, uh, what, what we got preached on, so um, that's okay. I should have told him, and then he could have preached a couple sermons for me. Oh, next time. Well, we're going to pick that back up. We're going to go back to the book of Colossians. We've been going through it, if you remember, hopefully. Uh, we've been going through it uh, verse by verse. We've been going through it uh, section by section, looking at what Paul has to say to this church that is in Colossae. Just a reminder about what some of these things are that, that Paul's been talking to them about. He's talking about, first, how much he loves them and cares for them. He's been talking about how much he, 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 uh, he, he, even though he hasn't met many of them, how much his heart is with them. And then he's talking to them in their own cultural context. We remember, if we step back a little bit, we talked a little bit about these uh, Greco-Roman people, these people who grew up not in a Jewish background, but people who grew up in, in uh, the Roman world with Roman rules and Roman traditions and Roman religions, and, and how... Maybe they are understanding this new faith and some challenges for them. And then also, Paul talks to the Jewish Christians in this, uh, in this new thing called the church and how, how they are to live and be, how they are to remember what they are about and about what God is about. We're going to continue that theme this morning as we look at the book of Colossians. Uh, we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 2 and we'll be reading from verses 16 through 23. Before we read that, let me offer a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for your word and for your measuring tool of Jesus Christ. Thank you that as we examine this, we recognize there might be challenges to our own hearts about who we are and what we do, but in all, there is good news that you are the one who has freed us and forgiven us. Remind us of this truth as we examine this word today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would, join me, Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23, should be page 1143 if you're picking up your pew Bible, which is uh, in front of you. Let's read this together. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch these rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I'm going to list off a few items. I'm going to see if you can tell me what they all have in common. And when you know it, go ahead and say it. Tape. Glue. Adhesive. Well, that was quick. Did you know there are whole groups of people, that's what they do, is study adhesives? I have a friend, he's in chemistry. He's, uh, he's got his PhD in chemistry, and that's what he's studied. He studies how to, uh, he studied how to make things stick together better. He makes a whole career out of that. It, there's big money in that. <laughs> how do we make things stickier? Over the years, things have gotten stickier and stickier. We can see things like uh, Gorilla Tape, Gorilla Glue. You can go to the store and buy it. Uh, you can get even things that are stronger that, are, uh, that will uh, don't put your hands together when you've got that on. You know, we won't get them apart. We like to measure that kind of thing. We like to think that we can stick things together and they won't come apart. That's why they make things stickier and stickier. They have claims of, you won't ever be able to get this apart. Well, that's because we, we like to think that things are going to stick, that they won't come apart, that things won't fall apart, that when we have something, that we want it to be held together well and that, that, uh, that, that we want to make sure that it's not going to crumble, that it's not going to come to pieces, that, that the things that we have, that we rely on, are not going to, uh, to, to, to disintegrate. Now, we try and we try and we try to hold things together, and that's maybe in our human nature. Uh, we come up with things that are going to uh, really make sure things won't fall apart. We really like to do that. That can make its way into our spiritual lives, I think, into our walk with God, into our uh, understanding of what God is doing, and actually that's exactly what's happened in this church that Paul is talking to. He's talking to a group of people who are, have become really obsessed, really uh, sure that they know how to make sure that they and God stick. They've come up with a whole bunch of things, a bunch of qualifications, a bunch of things that say, uh, this is what it looks like to really be stuck to God, to really make sure that you're not going to come apart, or to really make sure that you and he are together, to make sure that you really are the genuine deal. We don't have to look far, we just have to look at the first verse here, uh, to see what some of these things are. But what Paul's going to have us know is that these are not, that they are inadequate things. That, that as much as these people hold on to these things and want to try, uh, they're, they're going to be inadequate. And we're going to talk a little bit in a bit about why uh, that's so dangerous and why we need something better. But first, let's look at what the church here is doing, what these people are doing, what these uh, likely Jewish Christians in this church are, are coming to. The first thing they bring up is uh, the basis of their lifestyle. What they're saying is, well, you know, to be really connected with God, to be really a part of this thing called the church, to be really a part of, of, of Jesus, this is what you have to do. Uh, they had what were called, well, we still understand, if you go to the grocery store, uh, Jewish people eat a certain way with certain dietary restrictions. What's that word? Kosher. Kosher. They, uh, we still have that. You can go and buy kosher, uh, kosher wine. You can't eat pork. The Jewish people in, the, in this Christian church are coming and saying, well, you know, to be really, really, really connected, uh, you need to eat in this particular way. This is what you got to do. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. We don't even have to look far. There are these Jewish Christians that are saying, you're not really a part of the club unless you do this. Unless you're uh, eating in this particular way, if you, unless you're forsaking bacon, which would be hard for many of us, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that's not a rule, but Paul is saying this is what they're doing. If you're not really a part of it, this is your connection to the church. This is your connection to God, whether you follow these uh, lifestyle habits. And then there's not just that, he goes on and he says, uh, well, you know, there's also, uh, do not let anybody... Uh, 
disregard you with uh, new moon celebrations or Sabbath festivals or, or religious festivals. What Paul is saying is there's a whole host of things that the Jewish people had and practiced. There's a whole host of things that the Jewish Christians would have, would have held on to and thought were important. They, they had a whole series of, you can go on, I'll leave you to, if you want to, look in a little further, but uh, on the internet about what some of these were, but things we might recognize, things like Passover, where the people came and they remembered uh, God passing over the houses in Egypt, which we, we uh, studied uh, earlier this year, sparing the oldest children. The Day of Atonement, when, when people remembered God's forgiveness of sins and, and, and the Feast of the Booths, this day when they, this week when they would go out and the Jewish people would actually set up like tents outside of the city and they would remember living in the wilderness and how God was good to them. And, 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 and there were all these festivals, including Sabbath, which was something they practiced every week. Now, Notice, these things aren't bad, but what they had become for so many of the Jewish people were markers, adhesives. If you hadn't practiced these things, if you didn't practice these things, they said, you're out. You're not really a part of the group. You're disqualified. Maybe it wasn't those two things. Maybe somebody was okay with somebody eating a, a, a pork bacon uh, fried sandwich. Or, or maybe they were okay, well, you don't have to practice all the different religious practices that we do. Maybe that's okay. But if it wasn't for that, maybe there's the posture that somebody had in their heart. Paul here talks about delight people who delight in false Humility, the worship of angels going on in detail about visions. We might have a, a he says, they're puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. It, it, it might be hard for us to, at a first glance to understand what this is talking about. But if we think a little bit, I don't think it's too hard. Have you ever met somebody who uh, has to go on and on about how, uh, how much they've done in their spiritual life? Somebody who has to prove themselves and, and show how good they are. I knew somebody who every time I saw them, they had to feel like they had to tell me about a new uh, great spiritual experience they had had and, and, and how they had to, it felt like they had to prove themselves every single time. And about how they had seen visions and how they, they had received a particular word from God. And, and I got the sense that this wasn't always God glorifying. It was something more about building themselves up. That's something uh, we have to discern, I think. It's certainly good to talk about what God is doing. But uh, maybe if we want the best picture or a good picture of what this looks like in our, uh, in our religious life, Jesus tells us a story. From Luke 18, 9 through 14, it's this story of, of somebody with this posture of heart who comes and they says, well, uh, the, 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 do you know this story based on the picture? Anybody know it? It's the story of uh, this, this Pharisee, this publican is the true old term, who comes and says, thank God that I'm not like that person over there. And then there's a the tax collector, this guy who uh, would have been down and out, considered sinful, and he comes and he says, I, I'm, I am just a poor sinner, God have mercy on me. And, and, and Jesus says, don't be like the guy who's puffed up. The guy who thinks he's got it all together. The guy who, who's coming and, and pretending and, and acting as if he is, he is he's all there. Being puffed up, full of himself, looking down on other people because of his posture. We have all three of these things. There's this practice of how they eat and this practice of, of what their religious practices were and, and this practice of, well, I am more spiritual and more together than this other person over here. And, and what they're saying in this Colossian church, these, these people are coming and they're saying to people who aren't doing what they're doing, guess what? We've got it and you don't. We are really connected to Jesus. We are really connected to God and, and you're not. And they're saying, 
Get your act together. What it comes down to is people like to try to measure how good they are and how connected they are to God. People like to, I like the way uh, it says in one story in the Bible, somebody comes and they're trying to justify themselves. We feel like we have to earn our way or prove ourselves or think that unless I do X, Y, or Z, eat this type of food or do this kind of practice or, or have this kind of devotion and spirituality, then, then I'm not really connected to the church. And this comes with a whole host of problems. Actually, I'm going to list two for us. We can extrapolate from there. I'll leave that to you to wrestle with what, that, what else that might uh, have. But first of all, I think that's really difficult to have this posture. It, it's, it's difficult for us to go on and on and on trying to, to prove ourselves, to prove that we are really connected, that we really are a part of the church. We can put so much pressure on ourselves that, that, and, and we can have so much doubt and this can lead to so much anxiety. I won't ask anybody to raise your hands, but just think, if you ever had that in your life, where you've wondered, am I really a part of this? Does God really love me? Have I really done enough? If we wrestle with that, we might be tempted to try to do what these people in the church are doing. To say, I am good enough because I've done this, this, and this. It's not just hard for us, though. I think it's misleading and it's difficult for each other, for other people. Can you imagine what these people are feeling like with these people coming in and saying, guess what, to be loved by God, you've got to do this and you've got to do this and you've got to do this. You've got to live up to my expectation. You've got to live up to what I think is right, even if it's not biblical. You have to believe in a particular view. You have to believe and follow this person. You have to eat in this way. You have to believe in this political view. And if we think this is not a big deal, we have to look at what Paul says in verse 19. It's really serious. Paul uses the image of the church as a body. He uses the image of the church as a body, and the thing that holds the whole body together is the head. In this text and in this imagery, in this, Paul uses Jesus actually as the head, the one who gives life. We remember there's also this text, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever's connected to me has life. And he says this, they have lost connection. These people who are passing judgment, these people who are coming with uh, these rules and regulations about what it is to be connected, they have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. That's significant. He's interestingly saying the only people who, are, uh, not, who don't have life are the ones who are passing this kind of judgment. They've missed the point of what God is all about. They are not connected to the source of life because they are still trying to earn their way into God's love. That's serious. Because the point of the Christian faith is not what we have done. It's not that we've done enough. It's not that we have earned our way. It's not that we have done X, Y, or Z. It's not that we followed a particular practice. It's not that we believe in a particular system. It's that uh, we, we come in faith to what God has done. I want us to look at uh, what Paul says first. He says, do not let anyone judge you. He says, do not let anyone disqualify you. 
based on what you've done, what you've believed, how you've acted. These aren't what binds you to God. These aren't the things that qualify you. Let no one judge you based on what you've eaten or what you've drank or what you've done or or, or what you've believed or or who you've associated with. Don't let anyone judge you or disqualify you based on what, uh, what your practices are or have been. Those are not what binds you to God. I love what Paul says in the book of Galatians. He says, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, no one will be able to be justified. We have, we have this this theology that says, uh, and this is where if, if anyone says we don't need theology, somebody says we don't need to understand what we believe, we don't need to, I, I think that's wrong because it is so helpful to understand what God does say and how it all fits together. This means that the only thing that binds us, the thing that, uh, that brings us to, to, to God is that God has come to us and that we can't earn our way there. We can't do it. It doesn't matter how many Sabbaths we've practiced. It doesn't matter how many times we have, have uh, tried to keep on the straight and narrow path. It doesn't mean, uh, it's not based on, on, on what we've previously believed or what we've held to. And, and if we keep trying to do that, it means we don't get it. This is so hard for us to get because we live in such a performance society, uh, a, a society that tries to measure everything. We are people who like to measure. My guess is that Paul has no problem with many of these things, the eating and the practicing and the Sabbath and the but it's how they're used. My guess is that there are many of us, some of us maybe, who are tired, have tired ourselves out trying. We've we've tried to prove ourselves. We worried about if we're in. We're concerned about whether we're spiritual enough or have prayed enough or if we've, we've done enough or if we've been good enough or if we've, we've uh, believed the right thing or if we've got our act together enough. And, and the good news of the gospel is that that's not what brings us to God. Rather, the good news of the gospel is that you are already bound to Christ He's already taken you and he's already forgiven you. He's already uh, brought you into his presence and he's already said, you are my beloved child. And the only thing that qualifies you is that I say so. And that my blood has covered you and that I no longer see the sin. I no longer see all of, even though your good things are good, that's not what I see. I see what brings you into my presence is, is that I have forgiven you. That is so freeing for us. It should be anyways. That you are secure, that you have peace, that you can stop worrying about whether you are in or out, but also we can stop worrying about other people as well. Not that we don't care about them, but we don't have to pass judgment. It's not about what they've done. It's not about if they are doing good enough. It's not about uh, how they are acting. It's not about uh, their lifestyle. It's, it's, it's between them and God, and actually it's not any of that. It's that God wants to connect with them. We need something stronger than ourselves to connect us to God. You know, a couple of years ago, I, maybe some of you know, I bought a boat, and um, when I bought it, I didn't look too closely at it. I should have looked closer. Uh, because when I got it home, I noticed that there was a significant crack in part of, the, uh, part of the structural integrity of the boat. If I took duct tape, would that have worked to fix that? No. What about super glue? You don't think so? 
I had to bring it to our brother Andy, and he welded it for me. He welded it, and so far it's held up. If we try to repair our relationship with God by keeping the rules or by trying to be good enough, going to church enough, eating right, if we try to repair our relationship with God by, by, uh, by being spiritual enough, praying enough, we've missed the point that God has already fixed the crack. He's welded us to himself. Those things are good, but they help to build us up. They help to strengthen our knowledge of God, but we're already connected. We're already welded. We don't have to worry about if we're in or not. You're already there, brothers and sisters, if you have faith in Christ. That's good news. That's the gospel. Not what I have done, but what Christ has done for me, already binding me to himself so that nothing can separate us in all of creation from his love. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, that you are so good. That you have bound us up to yourself. And that while we have good practices, good things that are uh, good in our lives that help us appreciate you more and help us to know you deeper. Let those things not be the things that we think earn us a place with you. Help us to remember that it is only in Christ, only in Jesus, that we are bound to you. It is only by your blood and your forgiveness that we are able to come to yourself. And you've already done it. As we realize this, Lord, may we be free of the guilt. May we be free of the temptation to try to earn our way. Lord, may we be free of the temptation like the Colossian church to, to judge each other based on what we are doing or not doing. Lord, may we be free in our own hearts recognizing that you have already bought us and paid us and paid for us and nothing separates us from yourself. Within our own hearts, Lord, Holy Spirit, work that assurance. Remind us that you will not lose your children. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite you to rise in body or in spirit to uh, sing our final song.
Just a reminder, stay afterwards for coffee and cookies. And uh, right before I left, last Sunday, I asked us to do something. I'm going to ask us to do it again. If you see somebody you haven't seen in a while, somebody you haven't talked with, uh, try to go talk with somebody you don't normally talk with after church. It's good for us to do that. As we go from here, remembering that uh, we cannot be separated from the love of God, nothing can separate us from the love of God, no height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you his perfect peace. Amen. Thank you.